Live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. And speaking of living like no one else, our own Rick Fuller just ran, swam, and biked 70 miles yesterday. Him and his wife, what an amazing accomplishment, Rick. We celebrate you today. 70 miles. I get tired walking up the stairs. 70 miles. That is amazing. Our topic today is timely. It is something we all need more of in our lives, and it's something that the world desperately needs from us to give to each other. Can anyone guess what the topic is? (laughs) Yeah, it is peace. It is peace. We need peace in our lives. The world desperately needs from us to give peace peace to each other. And I'm going to be honest with you, it was very challenging writing this Bible study today when as a nation we watched a high-profile court case that involved a man being killed by an officer in Minnesota. Emotions are high. I've talked to many of our church congregation members. They're dealing with the estates of deceased parents. They're dealing with health issues. They're dealing with grown children giving them a lot of issues. They're dealing with financial issues. Myself, my wife for three months has been battling this vertigo where she can't function normally until a couple weeks ago, a lady laid her hands on my wife and she was healed. She hasn't had those symptoms yet from vertigo. So (laughs) though I say all this is going around us, I still believe that just like in the New Testament, Jesus was on a boat and the waves were splashing this way and that way. It was crazy. The disciples thought that they were going to perish. Jesus is chill. He's calm. He walks on that water. He created that water. He stands up on the boat. He looks at the waves and he says, peace, be still. I still believe in that same power that he can look at the situation in your life right now. He can look at the situation in society and he can say, peace be still. If you're wondering what is the answer to a divided society, the answer is a unified church. That is so good. I'm going to say it one more time. The answer to a divided society is a unified church. Jesus said that he will build his church. He is asking us to be salt and light to the world. Why do we come here this morning? Why do we sit there? It's so that we can be equipped to do the work of Jesus out in our spheres of influence. And Jesus describes us as salt and light. Think about that. Light, what does it do? It expels the darkness. It shows the way for people who are lost. What about salt? Salt enhances the flavor. Salt prevents decay. You and I are to prevent the decay of society. And how do we do that? It's by being peacemakers. It's by being unified. But what is peace? For so many people, they hear the word peace, and it's our proclivity to look at peace through our Bay Area eyes. For some people, when I say peace, maybe their mind goes to the 70s and make peace, not war, right? Maybe they're thinking about Don Cornelius. They're thinking love, peace, and soul train, right? I don't know where your mind goes to. Maybe when I say the word peace, some people's mind goes to a sunset in Hawaii, hearing the waves crash. For some people, like my wife, maybe peace means going to get a manicure and a pedicure, and the kids are not with her for a couple of hours. (laughs) For some people, peace means being isolated with books and deep study away from everybody. But is this what Jesus meant when he said peace? And how can I be a peacemaker? Why is this so important? Because blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God. What is peace? How can I be a peacemaker? And have we fully grasped the idea that you and I are sons and daughters of the living King. Have we fully grasped that concept? You and I are royalty. 
I'm not sure when you look in the mirror what you think about yourself, but according to the word of God, when you look into the mirror, Jesus says, that is my son. That is my daughter. You are a royal priesthood. You are loved. You are not damaged goods. You are not a mistake. You are the head and not the tail. You are the lender and not the borrower. You are wonderfully and fearfully made that I have plans and not only plans, but a hope and a future and nothing shall separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. No height, no debt, no any created thing that you are his son and daughter. I know it's you're taking it in, you're processing it. We're talking about peace today and what that means. So our Bible study is one verse. I want us to stand up. I want us to read it together. And then we're going to jump into answering these questions. What, what is peace? How can I be a peacemaker? And have I fully grasped what it means to be a son and daughter of the king? Let's read it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We'll do it one more time, a little bit more energy, a little bit more excitement. I know it's 9 a.m., a little chilly outside, but hey, the Bible says we will know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. On the count of three, one, two, three, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now we're having church this morning. Father, I pray for every single person. This is my family. We are your children. And we ask that we would open our hearts and open our minds and that we would receive your peace. Father, your word says that you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are set on you. So right now, prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. Let us receive this truth. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Jesus says this, Peace I give you. My peace I leave you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let them be fearful. You know, there is a peace that the world gives. There is a peace that the world gives, it, but that peace is based on circumstances, and that peace is based on favorable outcomes. The world does give a peace, but if you build your peace on that foundation, it's going to be shaky because once that thing is taken, then your peace is gone. But Jesus says, a peace I give you that the world cannot give. Jesus says, this is a peace that passes comprehension. You see, because it's a peace not based on circumstances. It's a peace not based on what's happening in society. It's a peace not based upon what you think about yourself or what's going on inside of you. It's a peace that comes from the very throne of God. And it doesn't matter what's going around. You can know that you know that you know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So what is this peace? Let's watch this video and get a better understanding from the Bible Project. What is peace? The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. 
In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Awesome, awesome video. I recommend The Bible Project for every single person. It's an amazing resource where you can grow in your knowledge of the Word of God. Our teaching team utilizes it regularly. What stood out with that concept of peace was the idea of making complete or restoring the wall that was broken or a piece missing and then it was brought back together. That is peace. I'm not sure if you ever experienced a lack of peace. Someone wronged you. Something happened. Something was missing. Something got hurt. Your peace was taken. You can't sleep at night. Sick to the stomach. And then restoration was made. The peace came back. Is it no wonder why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace? Do you know that the Bible is a unified story that points to Jesus? So... As I was studying this Bible study, I got so excited because I saw how Genesis to Revelations put all the pieces together on this line of Jesus being peace and how he wants to restore. He wants to make us complete again. What do I mean by that? Let's go to the very beginning in Genesis. Adam and Eve, they ate the apple that they were told not to eat and now sin came into the world. There was guilt and shame. They recognized their nakedness. And what happened? There was sin and there was broken relationship between humanity and the Father. There was now a lack of peace. And it says in Genesis 3.24 that he drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword to guard the way. Have you ever heard this term before, the cherubim? It's referring to these angels, these amazing heavenly creatures. And here they are protecting the garden that God made for humans to live and have relationship with him. But as we go to Exodus, Jesus wants to have relationship with people again. He wants his presence to be there. So he creates this tent and he makes the Ark of the Covenant. And it says that there's these two cherubim of gold, hammered work, and you should make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. This is Exodus 25, 18. So in the garden, we see the cherubim placed. In the tent, when the Israelites were pulled out of slavery into the wilderness, we have cherubim now in the picture. And then we get to the temple in Jerusalem, where you can go past the veil 
into the Holy of Holies. And what image do we have again? We have the cherubim. Is it coincidence? Is it just by chance that we see this all throughout the chapter, all throughout the line of Israel? No. He's trying, God is trying through the Holy Spirit to make a point. And what is that point? That he wants to bring peace. He wants to bring restoration from human to God again. So when Jesus came to earth, when he died on the cross, it said that the veil was torn top to bottom. What does that symbolize? The veil was the barrier into the Holy of Holies. Only the priest and only one time of year can go into the Holy of Holies and be in the presence of God. Now that veil was torn top to bottom. Jesus said, it is finished. He took the hand of humanity and he took the hand of his father and he restored and brought right relationship. This is why we call him the Prince of Peace. Do you see how all these pieces are coming together from Genesis to Exodus to the temple in Jerusalem to Jesus dying on the cross? And then you get to Revelations and it says that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Did you guys realize that? When we think about heaven, we think about a place that we're going to go someday. But literally, Jesus is going to bring down a new heaven and a new earth. And do you know who gets to live in that kingdom? The peacemakers. Everyone who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. And then it says, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called what? Sons of God. I'm trying to put all these pieces together to help us understand the importance of peace. Jesus wants us to be his children. He wants us to be representations of our Father on earth. Being peacemaker is one way we can make earth more like heaven and people more like Jesus. We've spent 20, 30 weeks on this series, Kingdom Come, and the whole premise is you and I are representations of Jesus here on earth. Heaven isn't just a place we're going to go someday. Heaven isn't just a place that he's going to bring down on earth. You and I can literally experience circles of heaven everywhere we go. How can we experience that? By being peacemakers. That's how we can experience heaven on earth right now. When someone wrongs you, when someone betrays you, when someone speaks ill about you and you extend peace, you're bringing heaven on earth. Anybody remember their 20s? Any 20-year-olds right now? <laughs> In your 20s, I heard someone say this, that men aren't fully baked until they're 35. So I just turned 37. I'm starting to understand what that means. When I was in my 20s, uh, MySpace was a thing. I don't know if you guys remember MySpace. It was before Facebook. It was super corny. But anyways, my brother was dating a girl. Um, but there was another guy who liked that girl. So what this person did on MySpace, they made a rap song about how he's going to steal my brother's girl and then he's going to beat me up and then on and on and on. And in your 20s, that's a big deal. Like, I'm upset. I told my wife, get the baseball bat. We're going to go take care of this right now. And she was like, no, 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 no. One day you're going to be a pastor. Do you want to go into an interview? And this is on your record that you hit someone with a baseball bat. And me being a godly person said, I don't care. I want to beat them up, right? <laughs> See, it wasn't fully baked. I wasn't thinking, right? But my wife being, uh, having that gift of discernment saw something in me and saw something in that situation. And she said that, no, you need to extend peace in this situation. And I, I with all inside of me, did not want to do that. But never are you more like Jesus than when you are a peacemaker. Think about all the things that could have taken place if there's violence, if there's retaliation. Do you know that an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind? You and I are called to be peacemakers, but what is a peacemaker? If you're taking notes, a peacemaker are those who initiate everything which makes for a person's highest good. A peacemaker is those who initiate everything which makes for a person's highest good. Peacemakers use loving initiatives to bring peace between people and between people and God. One more time. 
Peacemakers use a loving initiative to bring peace between people and between people and God. So this is the seventh beatitude in our Bible study on the Sermon on the Mount. We learn blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is the seven blessedness, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. Another way to read our verse is this way, happy are those who make peace and produce right relationship between people and between people and God, for they are doing God-like work. Easier said than done. What are the benefits, though? I want to share with you an Old Testament story. Now, I want you to just follow along. The Old Testament was a different world than what we're living in right now. The characters in our story are not perfect people, but I believe it provides an amazing, amazing principle to what we're talking about today. Has anyone ever heard the story of Abigail, 1 Samuel 25? I think we have someone in our church named Abigail, named after that story. What I love about the story of Abigail, it's, it's something that we all can relate to. David and his mighty men were taking care of some property and taking care of possessions for a guy named uh, Help me out. It was in Nepal. Nabal. Thank you. Nabal. They were taking care of the flock and the property for Nabal. And David sends messengers to Nabal and saying, hey, we're, we're tired. We're a little bit hungry. Can you provide for us? Because we have been taking excellent care of your stuff. And what does Nabal say? Nabal says, forget you. I don't care. Why am I going to take my sheep and share with you? Why am I going to take my bread and share with you? Why am I going to take my wine and give it to you guys, a bunch of shepherds? And you know what David says? One of my favorite verses on the Bible. He says this, men, strap on your swords. That's my favorite <laughs> verse in the Bible. I love it, right? It was like, it was like get the bat, right? It's like, uh, <laughs> uh, in, in East San Jose, we would say, get the clip or get the Glock. Okay, and I, I don't advocate violence. David is saying, somebody got to go. <laughs> somebody get the sword, right? Oh boy, I like having fun with you guys. <laughs> and David is marching. And David tells himself in his heart, he says this, every single male of Nabal, am I saying it right? Every single male is going to get slaughtered. Every single male. He got 400 men. He told them, get the sword. Here we go. But what happens? We have this amazing, intelligent, beautiful woman named Abigail. I was right last week when I said 99% of the time your wives are right. Listen to them, right? So Abigail goes out. She bows herself before the king. She apologizes. She gets in front of David and Nabal. She brings gifts, she brings food, she brings all these things. She was a peacemaker. She was a peacemaker. She stopped Nabal from getting slaughtered. She stopped all the men in her family from getting slaughtered. She stopped David and her men from shedding blood. And there was peace in the situation. Blessed are the peacemakers. Do you know what ends up happening for Abigail? It says that her abusive, drunk husband has a heart attack and dies. And then David asks her to be the queen. And then she's now financially secure. And now her husband is super fine. How do we know that? David was fine because in verse 42, it says, Abigail quickly got on the donkey and took off to go marry. You know, she was with a bad-tempered, unfriendly person. And she's being asked to be the wife of a queen now. And now her children are going to be royalty. So let's have proper hermeneutics right now. I'm not saying that if you're a peacemaker, the spouse that you don't like is going to disappear, right? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you're going to be rich. I'm not going to say that your children are going to be royalty. But think about it. Our verse says, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons and daughters of the king. So... Blessed, what does blessed mean? Blessed means living in such a way that we invite God's favor upon our lives by obeying and living out his values. 
Do you know that says that when a man's ways are pleasing with the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him? We want to be blessed. We want favor. We want to be successful in all that we do. Jesus gives us the remedy on how to do that. Commit your plans to the Lord and he will crown your efforts with success. Commit your ways to the Lord and they will succeed. Blessed are the peacemakers. You see, we're not spending 30 weeks because we can't think of another topic, right? We're spending all this time because we want to give you tools and kingdom behavior and covenant relationships so everywhere you go goodness and mercy and favor will chase after you why why is this why is everything you touch succeeding why is it when you walk into a place favor and mercy chases you and when you leave favor and mercy chases you my pastor used to say ray oh my back hurts why pastor because everywhere i go god's goodness is upon me it's so heavy right he would mercy chases me when i go favor chase it doesn't mean you're not going to have problems and situations the bible says in this life you will have problems but take heart i have overcome the world i'm trying to instill principles in my life and in your life that are going to make you successful everywhere you go blessed are the peacemakers they will be called children of God. I I look at the story of, of Abigail. What does that mean for you and I? Well, I said you're not going to be rich, but actually I'm I'm wrong. You will be rich. You'll be spiritually rich. If you're a child of the king, think about it. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills that he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. So you will be rich in heaven when you are a peacemaker. So amazing, so amazing. We are royalty. Let's talk about making peace between people and God. This is what Jesus said. I referenced it earlier. When Jesus hung on the cross, he grabbed the arms of humanity and he grabbed the arms And he brought reconciliation. He is the prince of peace. You and I are called to make peace between people and God. Building relationship with people far from God than guiding them to him. Never are we more a child of God than when we do this. Do you know that the church will be its fullest capacity when we are an every person evangelist? What do I mean by that? Every single one of us are sharing Jesus in our sphere of influence. We are called to bring peace between our brothers and sisters and between God. I heard an interesting story about Gandhi, who was an amazing man, who was actually a peacemaker. And do you realize that the world hates peacemakers? Gandhi, what happened to him? Murdered and killed. Martin Luther King Jr., what happened to him? Murdered and killed. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, what happened to him? He was murdered and killed. What's going on with these peacemakers? And they're getting killed and all they want to do is bring peace because we are in a spiritual battle against the prince of this earth who is satan he wants to kill steal, and destroy but jesus came that you may have life and have it to the full how can we experience that life we experience that life when you and i are peacemakers easy to do it when things are favorable A lot more challenging when people are writing songs about you and putting them on MySpace, right? We are called to be evangelists everywhere we go. Gandhi made the comment. He says, I have nothing against your Jesus. It's just his followers I have a problem with. He said, if you really believed, if you really believed there was this place of hell and gnashing of teeth and eternal torment wouldn't you do anything to make a convert man and that was super convicting when i when i heard that and if you hear that and it stings i want you to know that it's not condemnation but an indication that you and i are all on this journey we're growing to be more like jesus But there is a hurting world out there. And just in the Bay Area alone, 6 million people out of 8 million people do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if we really believe if if people pass away 
and do not have a relationship with Jesus and they're going to a place of eternal fire, what does that mean for us as a church? It means that we need to mobilize. It means that we need to be peacemakers. It means we need to go to the highways and the byways out of the safety net of our four walls and every single person we exhibit peacemakers and we share the love of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying to be weird. I'm not saying to... Sometimes the problem I've met in Christianity and I experienced just at district council that's last week, there's just some Christians that are just weird. Like, you can't have a conversation with them. I don't want to get into details, but the person told me because I went to the doctor, I got a mark of the beast and all these type of things. And if you speak to the normal rank and file person who is unfamiliar with the church, you're going to scare them. You know? I'm all about the spiritual gifts, but there's some spiritual gifts that are for the believer and there's some spiritual gifts that are for the non-believer. That's why Jesus says, pray for the more excellent gift, which is prophesying, uttering a word that someone can understand that is according to the word of God. What I mean by evangelism is everywhere we go, everything we do, we represent the king. Everywhere we go, everything we do, we represent the king. Maybe it's a smile Maybe it's a smile. Maybe it's how you're doing. How are you doing today? Maybe it's, can I, can I help you with some groceries? Maybe it's, oh, you're moving? Let me help you pack your house. Or you're going to the gym, let's, let's, let's work out together. The Bible says even if you give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, you will not lose your reward. Maybe, just maybe, being a peacemaker is see a need, fill a need. You can write that down, see a need, feel a need. But some of us have a problem being a peacemaker because maybe we haven't made peace with ourselves. You can't give what you do not have. And I believe we're in a time where a lot of people, they walk around with guilt, they walk around with condemnation, they walk around with hurt. And I understand because there's been abuse, there's been wrong, there's been so much tragedy going up in life. If, if I asked how many of us have experienced a tragedy, every single person would raise their hand. If we opened up the mic right now and started giving testimony, we would hear testimony after testimony of domestic violence, of sexual abuse, of domestic violence, of experience the loss of a family member. Every single one of us has a story. And the Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That story is powerful. That is actually the indication where God is leading you to bring healing on earth here and now. I want you to hear that God has accepted us. Why do we not accept ourselves? The Bible says there is no condemnation those who are in Christ Jesus. Many live with a deep sense of shame and guilt, a broken multi-generational heritage of self-rejection, self-loathing, disabling insecurity, and low self-esteem. Let's believe and receive the promises of God and live up to our new identity in Christ. You are a child of the King. We talked about what peacemake means. We talked about what it means to be a peacemaker Let's briefly talk about what does it mean to be a child of God? I think about the prodigal son. He insulted his father when he said, give me the inheritance. You wouldn't do that in days of antiquity in that culture. That was like telling to your father, I wish you were dead so I can have all your stuff. Can you imagine the hurt of the father? Yet the father gives him inheritance. And what does that son do? He goes to a far off land and he starts partying. He starts living it up, live fast, die young. The person who dies with the most toys wins. He spends it on loose living. He spends it on wild women. He spends it on everything. And now he has no money. He finds himself in a pig trough. Do you know when you hear the word pig as a Jewish person, you would be disgusted. You would be repulsed. You wouldn't even touch a pig. And now the prodigal son is in a pig trough, loathing to eat, longing to eat the the food of the pigs. And he comes to his senses. And I want you to catch this. Many people never turn to Jesus because we rescue them. We never let them come to their senses. 
You see, it's till we hit rock bottom and people in our lives hit rock bottom. They look to Jesus and they come to their senses. And he says, even my father's servants are living better than what I'm living right now. I'm going to go to my father and say this. I am no longer worthy to be your son. I am no longer worthy to even have your name. I am no longer worthy to even be in your presence, but if you would just hire me, I would be honored to work for you. And I can imagine him picturing this in his, in his head as he walks closer and closer. Look, I'm not worthy to be your son, but just let me work. I'm not worthy to be your son. But it says that the father was looking off in the distance when he saw his son, he ran. And that was another powerful moment because you didn't run in those days of antiquity. You, you wouldn't bring yourself low to run towards someone. Yet he ran to a son. He wrapped his arms around him and, and he embraced him. And he put a robe upon him. He covered his shame. He put sandals on his feet. You're no longer a slave. You're my child. He put a ring on his finger. Why I hear that story and why it brings tears to my eyes is because for so much of my life and even to this day, I look in the mirror many times say, I shouldn't be a pastor. I shouldn't be a campus pastor. I'm disqualified. I made too many mistakes. This shouldn't happen. This is not going to work. Everything's going to fall apart. And then I had this amazing moment when we were getting installed. My father-in-law came up to me. He gave me a, a box and he put this ring <laughs> on my finger and I started broken out in tears because he didn't know what that meant to me in that moment because for so long I was saying I'm disqualified I'm disqualified I'm disqualified and I felt like God spoke through my father-in-law he put this on my finger and he said no 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 you are my son you are my child you are forgiven your role royal priesthood that you're not disqualified your sins are forgiven now get up and be a peacemaker and do what i'm asking you to do and some of you are thinking what possible difference can i make society is broken what possible difference can i make there's too much work to be done there's too many people it reminds me of a time when i went to laguna beach and i was walking around and i saw Hundreds of hundreds of starfish is washed up on shore. And I'm like, man, that stinks, that starfish. Like, they're, they're, they're not going to live when they're out of the ocean. Man, that's a terrible thing. Like, what, what is going on? And I'm just kind of moping around. That's so terrible. These starfishes are going to die. But isn't it a beautiful beach? And isn't it a beautiful sand? And my daughter starts picking up starfishes and putting it in the water. And I'm like, babe, you... you what are you doing? Like, well, I got to help rescue them and put them in the water. I'm like, babe, no, you, you can't rescue all of them. What are you doing? And she picked it up and said, dad, it means something to this one right here and put it back in the water. You see, maybe you can't save everyone, but you can save people in your sphere of influence. Maybe you can't save the whole, the whole world. Maybe you can save the people in your world. So when you stand before God and said, hey, I made a difference for this one. I made a difference for this one. Don't look at all the stuff that can, what's going on in the world. Think about your world and being a peacemaker because blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God. If I can have someone from the team come up and, and play a little bit. I know it was a heavy topic, there's many times I get up here and wrestle on what, what can I say? So I get on my knees and I fast and I say, Lord, it's not about me. It's about my brothers and sisters here. So I believe in this moment, some of us need a, a, a touch of peace. Some of us need, it's, it's like that duck sitting on the water looks calm, but underneath you're paddling a million miles an hour. I just want to have just a couple of minutes that if you need to experience just a touch of peace, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I never want to miss an opportunity for people to accept Jesus in their heart, for people to experience a touch from the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit can do more in one touch than I can do in a million sermons. He is the King of Kings. He is the Prince of Peace. And He wants you and I to be peacemakers. So if you need just a touch of peace, 
If you want to come up here, I'll, I'll anoint you with oil. We'll have our second opportunity. Maybe you want to kneel where you're at. Maybe you just want to stand and lift your hands. But I, I'm believing that in this moment, if you're needing that touch of peace, the Holy Spirit will come down, wrap his arms around you, and remind you that he is the Prince of Peace.